Hello, good evening. Uh, Merry Christmas to you all. Uh, today's uh, sole speaker is uh, Dr. Prakash, Prakash Kumar from uh, SRM University, Andhra Pradesh, Amravati. So let me say a few words uh, about uh, Prakash, Prak Dr. Prakash Kumar. So Dr. Prakash Kumar is a younger young researcher, one of the young researchers in the field of fluid mechanics, particularly in fluid flow to deformable porous media. The application of his research area is into the biological mathematics, especially in tissue engineering. He obtained his PhD from IIT Kharagpur under the supervision of Professor G.P. Rajasekhar. He has publications in top-notch journals like International Journal of Engineering Sciences, Physics of Fluids, and Mathematical Methods in Applied Sciences. He is also a reviewer of Physics of Fluids. Currently, Dr. Prakash Kumar is working as an assistant professor in the Department of Mathematics at SRM AP University. So, um, Dr. Prakash Kumar will give a talk today on mathematical modeling of bioreactor intuition meaning. So, uh, Dr. Prakash Kumar, it's a uh, uh, thank you for accepting our invitation and uh, it's our privilege so to host your talk so it's all over to you thank you thank you very much thank you for, very much for your kind words so i will begin my shot immediately uh, this talk immediately that would be kind of short also and i'll use very simple words so that everyone can understand so the overview should be clear to you all. <clears throat> I hope my screen is visible to you all. Can you see my screen? Yes, it is visible. Yeah, okay. So the talk is on mathematical modeling of bioreactors in tissue engineering. Now in the title itself, there are two things to know mathematical modeling we understand that we need to model something and that too with mathematical governing equations and all what are bioreactors and what is tissue engineering these two are the main things which we need to focus on so first of all i would like to give credit to my uh, colleagues and of course my supervisor under whom i have done this whole work so now let us understand from beginning so we have seen lizards, right? And whenever lizard loses its tail, then what happens is it grows by its own. So lizard doesn't require any kind of medical treatment to regrow its uh, tail. Why it is happening so fast is because lizard have highest amount of stem cells. Stem cells are those cells in the human body or in any mammal those which can degrade itself into another kind of cells or they can just transfer, uh, transform from one uh, kind of cells to another kind of cells. So in lizard what happens is the high number of those stem cells knows that at which level in what kind of cells it has to transform like it has to transform into muscle, some kind of little bones and some kind of skin also. So they grow in same particular manner and lizard can grow its tail. Now, what we can get from this, what is uh, how this is helpful to a human one. So after looking at all these and un understanding the behavior of cells, a scientist has come to a conclusion in the sense that what if we are going to use this kind of methodology in human beings? Are we also uh, in uh, are we in such a position so that we can grow our own limbs back? Unless we are dead fool, uh, we can't do that, right? So what we are going to do is, we are, suppose there are many uh, patients 
who are suffering from several uh, function disorder like uh, uh, heart failure or uh, kidney failure something like that so what we will do is because in humans those stem cells are very low in amount so we are going to capture those stem cells from the human body itself and because these cells are very less in amount so we are going to cultivate it cultivate means we are going to generate more amount of such kind of cells when these cells will be generated in large amount will put it into a 3d architecture that we call a scaffold so it looks something like this so this 3d architecture can be of any kind it can be kind of if you suppose that you have to grow your ears it should be in the shape of ear it, if you have to grow your heart then it should be in the shape of heart so what we will do we will seed all these cultivated cells into such kind of architecture where, and this architecture is a kind of porous medium and then this architecture will be substituted inside a bioreactor where we supply all such uh, uh, necessary environment for the cells where it can grow properly like that environment should mimic the human body itself because in human body every day our new cells are generating it is undergoing degradation it is coming out of our body in many means right and why it is happening because we have a continuous supply of nutrient so such kind of environment we have to create inside a bioreactor so that cells can grow they can take the shape of our scaffold and that will be our kind of organ and we, we can implant it into a human body so this is the whole idea from scaffold itself there are two methods either we can go to generate these cells inside a bioreactor or directly put this scaffold inside the human body itself now both have several advantages disadvantages advantage in bioreactor is this kind of engineering is known as ex vitro and if we put the scaffolds inside the human body we call this as in vivo so advantage of ex vitro is we can see that how cells are growing how how long it takes and we can measure other things other spectacle uh, some important kind of data out of it in other case if these scaffold are fitted in, into a human body it will be difficult for us to see that how cells are growing whether these scaffolds are creating some kind of disbalance in the body or not or it is undergoing some kind of malfunction or not so these things we can't observe in in vivo otherwise in ex vitro we can observe these things we can see that how things are working so this is the whole idea based on this we have defined what is our this is engineering so it is a kind of interdisciplinary field that applies all the principles of engineering life science to develop this kind of behavior inside a body or we can grow the functioning tissue or organ for a human itself so our bioreactors can be of different shapes so we have shown some of the bioreactors over here so this is a perfusion bioreactor that means a scaffold will be fitted nutrient supply will be supplied from the top and it will get down from the bottom this is a hollow fiber membrane bioreactor similarly there is a rotating disc bioreactor so the outer wall of this cylinder this is a kind of cylinder and this is just a annular overview of the cylinder these are the scaffolds and these are cells as well the nutrients so cells will occur, uh, uh, be fitted in these kind of scaffolds while outer wall will rotate and then the cells can undergo the uh, proliferation with respect to the amount of nutrients provided into it similarly there is another kind of bioreactor where we have scaffold in the middle of the bioreactor uh, bioreactor is, uh, is in the shape of cylinder and from the annulus region we can provide the amount of nutrients which are required for the cells to grow now what are the factors that is very important and necessary in the bioreactor the ph quantity of the nutrient its temperature pressure moreover what kind of nutrient supply is required for a different different kind of cells and then how to remove the waste those are created by the metabolism of cells so these are some important factors which we need to keep track while doing some experiments
Now, scaffolds, as I told you earlier, this is a kind of 3D architecture where cells will be seeded. Now, what are the properties of scaffold? Scaffold should be biodegradable. That means over time, when cells are growing, it will occupy the spaces, then there will be very less amount of permeability inside the scaffold region. So this is a kind of porous structure. When there will be very less amount of uh, space, then we want our scaffold architecture to degrade by itself so that more space can be created and nutrients can be supplied inside these cells, right? So to construct these kind of scaffolds, we use either polymers, those are synthet synthetic in nature, or natural polymers, or ceramic, depending on the kind of uh, things we are growing. Like suppose if you are growing the bone, then we need calcium phosphate for that. If you are growing some soft tissues, then we require natural polymers. And what happens with natural polymers is that the, these are elastic in nature. That means when there uh, some pressure will be applied on these kind of scaffolds, it will undergo a deformation, right? So that's why my topic of study is flow through deformable porous media. And these scaffolds, when it, uh, these are constructed with natural polymer, polymers, these becomes a kind of deformable porous media. So what are the challenges and aim in this? The challenges are very typical starting from the biopsy itself to putting the cells inside the bioreactor. Every step is very critical. Now, while biops, uh, considering the biopsy, we have to take those kind of cells which are which can be transformed into another cells. That means stem cells. And this is very much important. Then what should be the appropriate material of the scaffold, which should be biocompatible with that cell. Biocompatible means it should not harm the cells. It should support the cell to grow, right? Then adequate amount of nutrient, whatever is required for the cells. So every kind of cell has different kind of their metabolism. Some cells uh, require more amount of nutrient, some require less. So based on that, we have to control the nutrient supply as well. Now, apart from this, their mechanical behavior, like how things are growing, how cells are uh, interacting with each other, how they are making a extracellular matrix or a strong uh, connection between each other to form a particular tissue because tissue is just not a cell, it is a pattern of cells. When cells grow in some pattern, then they form some kind of extracellular matrix and overall that would be known as a kind of tissue. Now, what are our aim? So whatever our challenges are, those are our aim itself. Some uh, extra thing is that we want to for, uh, create large tissues or large organs. So that is the main aim. And this can be done only if we are doing continuous experiment. And along with continuous experiments, what requires is the methodology to function these experiments otherwise experiments will go in vain and it it takes like uh, those are very expensive a bioreactor itself cost cost more than crores right so to uh, to reduce that amount of effort by our experimentalist or scientist what we are doing mathematically is we are studying these bioreactors where scaffolds are fitted into the bioreactors and nutrients are supplied into the scaffold. So we will study this with respect to different kind of cells, with different geometry of our bioreactor, and with amount of the nutrients supplied into it. And then we will be in a position to tell our experimentalist that these are certain data. If you go this way, there is maximum uh, uh, chance of getting success, right? So that's why we are performing mathematical model in this. And of course, this will be our economical also. So now, as I told you, when we are considering scaffold and that too, which is manufactured by a natural polymer, then what is happening is those uh, structure are deformable. Whenever a force will be applied on these architecture, it will undergo deformation. So now, when we are talking about fluid flow through deformable porous media, 
we are talking about fluid flow through a media where solid is also undergoing a change or deformation as well as our fluid is also undergoing some deformation so now our governing equation will be with respect to biphasic mixture equations because we have two phase in a medium one we have solid phase yeah. another we have Dr. fluid phase yeah uh, sorry for the interruption uh, could you yes. please uh, 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 scroll down and drag this uh, bottom ones like uh, yeah yeah, I am just hiding. After solid value is well, what is written? Yeah, please move. Yeah, keep it one some corner. Okay. Yeah, Thank is you. it fine now? Thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. fine. Please okay. go ahead. Thank you. Now we have two phase, solid phase and fluid phase. So when we are talking about these two, we have to form different governing equations with respect to solid phase and fluid phase because of their different nature. Although we will be considering some interaction between these two as well. So let us denote this phi beta as a volume fraction of one of the phase where beta can be S or F. S means the solid phase. F means the fluid phase. So we are talking about the conservation of mass first and phi F, phi beta, phi S or phi F you say. These denote the volume fraction of solid phase or fluid phase inside one medium. Right. Now this you can identify this is nothing but a kind of material derivative with respect to the fluid velocity uh, this with respect to this uh, volume fraction so this is conservation of mass j beta denotes the net amount of production of either solid phase or degradation of amount of the fluid phase because as solid will generate fluid volume fraction will degrade by itself so what is the nature of this uh, uh, volume fraction phi s plus phi beta that will make one one means overall volume of the medium now the momentum equation for momentum balance for solid phase as well as the fluid phase differs from each other in the sense that if you look at the inertial term this will look similar to your inertial term of the navier stokes equation where rho beta is the density this is whole of your convection term and inertial term, acceleration term. And then you have the viscous force or elastic force with respect to the fluid phase and solid phase. And there is an interaction between these two phases because at each point of the medium, solid and fluid simultaneously are occupying the space. We are assuming these governing equations in a macro scale. That's why we can talk about this now we when we are constructing the momentum balance for solid phase we consider the balance with respect to the solid displacement and solid displacement if you consider a time uh, uh, derivative of solid displacement it will give you the velocity of your solid phase so if you plug in these value over here so you will see that your elastic equation is of kind of hyperbolic equation Whereas your fluid momentum balance is of parabolic in nature. So we have two things. There is a coupling of parabolic and hyperbolic equation, right? And this term we are going to see in this slide. So this is our stress, which is given by the hydraulic pressure applied and the dielectric stress, which is applying on the fluid phase and solid phase so fluid phase will be depending on the fluid velocity whereas the solid phase it will depend on the solid displacement right now when we are talking about solid or fluid we are considering the viscosity of the fluid whereas for the elastic medium we have its young modulus or and poison ratio so these are known as these lambda s and mu s these are known as Lane's coefficient. And in terms of Young's modulus and Poisson ratio, this can be described in these two equations. Now, the interaction term, interaction is working on the principle of Newton's third law, right? Where force applied by one medium is in reversal of the force applied by another to the one. So, phi F is the force applied by fluid phase onto the solid, and phi S is the force applied by 
solid onto the fluid so these are given by the hydraulic resistivity of the fluid times the difference in the velocity of solid phase and fluid phase and the amount of deformation which is undergoing with respect to the volume fraction so this is our overall uh, governing equation for fluid phase as well as the solid phase that will work inside the scaffold region so these are few of our mathematical models so we are considering over here a hollow fiber membrane bioreactor if you look at this rectangle part this is elaborated over here so at the periphery of our bioreactor this is cylindrical but we will model this in 2d cartesian plane so at the periphery we can see there is a scaffold that means our deformable porous media governing equations biphasic mixture equations those will be applicable over here now scaffold and the lumen region through where our nutrients will be supplied there is a gap in between these two and that gap is filled by a very thin membrane that is very rigid so this is a kind of rigid porous media where the permeability of this region is very low that means what we want is whatever cells we are substitute we have substituted inside the scaffold those should not get away from the scaffold into the lumen region right to prevent this we have put a membrane over here so now what we have done in the scaffold region because we have solid phase cells inside these uh, spaces and there is fluid also so cells plus the scaffold we have consi considered these two as one of the solid phase itself so now we are dealing with only solid phase and the fluid phase in the scaffold region moreover we have considered some more properties of these scaffolds and those are because we are constructing the scaffold it is not necessary that it will be homogeneous but for our mathematical study we have considered that a scaffold is homogeneous as well as isotropic that means permeability is same at every point of the scaffold also we will limit our mathematical model up to short time scale because cells will take very large amount of time to regrow so you can see the development of uh, cells or proliferation of cells within week but for our mathematical model we are restricting ourselves for only one to two hours so that we can know that this much amount of cells are there and in this scenario how much nutrient should be supplied inside the whole bioreactor what are the other things which we need to keep control on right so we are looking for very low time and their fluid volume fraction solid volume fraction those will be kind of constant in such scenario these two momentum as uh, mass conservation equations inside the scaffold region will be reduced so phi f is constant so this term will go phi c is also constant this term will also go we will only only have fluid velocity and solid velocity moreover within this short scale of time there will be no proliferation in the cells so we can assume this gf as also zero so you can say that this mathematical model works on the instant time so at whatever time is experiment is going on if you know the number of cells your volume fraction you can just find out that what is your momentum balance what amount of fluid is uh, to be supplied what should be your fluid volumetric flux and what should be your amount of nutrient that has to be supplied inside the bioreactor so how things are working from one end of the bioreactor we are supplying the fluid and that too there is a control on the fluid volumetric flux that is being supplied right so the amount of pressure which scaffold this porous membrane and the lumen will face depends on the volumetric supplied uh, supp uh, the supply of fluid right based on this these are the governing equations which will allow us to find or to understand that what is the velocity at which kind of volumetric flux similarly the porous membrane because its permeability is very low so we are considering a darcy momentum balance inside the porous membrane whereas in the lumen region uh, pardon me uh, this is this should be a navier stokes equation this is a typo so in the lumen region we will have navier stokes equation for the fluid velocity 
at the boundary conditions we have symmetricity and uh, we are just looking at unidirectional fluid flow inside the bioreactor so that means a fluid is flow flowing from the inlet to outlet and there is no fluid moment, uh, movement around the periphery of the bioreactor right based on this the nutrient transport inside the bioreactor is given in this sense like nutrient concentration inside the lumen is depending on the advection and diffusion equation so this is the advection because of the fluid velocity inside the lumen region and this is the advection of the uh, nutrient supply that means how nutrient concentration can disperse inside the lumen region this is the nutrient concentration where we have advection as well as diffusion inside the rigid porous medium but inside the scaffold because we have cells over there they can consume the amount of nutrient and they can reduce the amount of concentration of nutrient inside the scaffold region so we have a reaction rate also that two of first order so this shows you the amount of nutrient being consumed by the cells and phi f de uh, denotes the fluid volume fraction so this fluid volume fraction whatever amount of nutrient is present in that that will be consumed by the cells and these are the respective boundary conditions so i will not go in detail because of time limit also so mostly we have continuity of nutrient concentration and continuity of flux at the boundary of each of the phases right now based on all these we have solved these equations either by approximation perturbation method lubrication uh, using lubrication approximation and we have got the uh, analytical solutions or you can say theoretical solution now how what we can get from this so we can understand first the behavior of displacement of the solid matrix which is present in the scaffold region so now this phi f this denotes the fluid volume fraction so that means if this is high in amount so red to black it shows the increase in fluid volume fraction simultaneously when you have large amount of fluid volume fraction your darcy number that shows the permeability permeability will also increase and with respect to a fixed amount of nutrient uh, this fluid volume flux from the inlet there will be change in the pressure gradient so when you have large amount of fluid space the fluid uh, pressure gradient inside the scaffold region will simultaneously decrease and when this is decreasing what is happening is for large amount of fluid where very less amount of solid is present there is very less deformation and when our amount of solid volume fraction is increasing the amount of deformation is also increasing that means when cells will grow with time then what we will observe is we will observe much more deviation in the deformation of the solid phase right so now what we are doing over here is we are analyzing the same thing but instead of different kind of uh, uh, fixed volume flux we are observing with respect to different volume fluxes so this ql in this denotes the volume flux from the inlet of the wire reactor that means from the one end so if this is high this will gradually increase the amount of hydraulic pressure inside the scaffold so that means in order to reduce the amount of deformation you have to reduce the fluid volumetric flux and if you are reducing fluid volumetric flux your pressure is decreasing simultaneously you can see less amount of deformation inside the scaffold region with respect to the nutrient now we have considered different kind of cells so this smcs smooth muscle cells are there chondrocyte cells are there hepatocyte cells are there and this phi square epsilon phi square this is a kind of metabolism which is a property of that cell so if this amount is large that means more amount of nutrient is being consumed by those kind of cells so in this particular case hepatocytes this consume more amount of nutrients than the smooth muscle cell 
Now, with respect to these three, what will happen if we will provide a fixed amount of nutrient concentration inside the bioreactor? So the cells which is consuming more amount of nutrient will consume large nutrients and large amount of nutrients and there will be a deficiency in the nutrient concentration. So this axis shows the amount of nutrient concentration present inside the bioreactor and this shows the length of your bioreactor. So along with the length because at the inlet you are providing with a fixed amount of nutrient. So there will be no deficiency at the inlet. But as you are moving towards the outlet of the bioreactor, because of more amount of cells, more amount of consuming or consumption of these nutrients, your concentration will gradually decrease. Now, this is a matter of concern. That means we have to control our uh, influx of fluid as well as the nutrient concentration so that we can remove this kind of discrepancy, right? Because we want equal amount of nutrient to be supplied in each part of the scaffold so that equal amount of uh, proliferation can take place, right? Now, this we are going to observe that how we can uh, increase or decrease the amount of nutrient flux inside the nutrient concentration inside the whole bioreactor with respect to the length. Now, again over here, the Pecle number, this shows that there is a ratio of nutrient convection to the diffusion. Now, when convection will be large, that means large uh, with respect to high amount of fluid velocity, the convection can be increased and simultaneously your nutrient supply will be higher over there or concentration will be higher. So with higher amount of Pecle number, we can see that there is a large amount of nutrient concentration with respect to that point where we have low amount of Pecle number. So for low Pecle number, you have less amount of nutrient concentration inside the whole length of the bioreactor. So we can see now that if we are going to control the fluid volumetric flux that is being supplied inside the bioreactor, our nutrient concentration will also change, right? So, and also with respect to the geometry. So, I, uh, sorry, I did not talk about the geometry or length of this. So we have considered this width of our lumen, this width of the porous medium that means AH minus H and BH minus AH is the width of our scaffold. Now all these data depends on the width of these also. So suppose if you have to grow more thicker scaffold, so your width of scaffold should be increased, right? And when we are dealing with our governing equations, that time we are non dimensionalizing all these things. So while non dimensionalizing our lumen width will remain as one. Our uh, this porous medium width can be given by A minus one and the scaffold width will be given by B minus A. So we are looking at our nutrient concentration over here with respect to different value of B and different value of A. So what we are saying, let us say our nutrient, uh, this uh, lumen width is given by 1.5, 1.6 or 1 let us say and our porous membrane is given by 2 that means the width of the porous membrane is 1 only and when we are talking about B equal to 5 and here A is equal to 2 so B minus A that means 3 units is the width of our scaffold. So when we are decreasing our width of scaffold with respect to the same amount of nutrient which is being supplied we can observe that if you are going to supply a same amount of nutrient inside our same width, let us say, then you will feel that if width is being increased, the amount of nutrient concentration inside the region will gradually decrease, right? So that's what is happening over here. So if you are going to construct large uh, or thicker uh, smooth cell, or let us say you are going to generate these kind of tissues, whose width is larger, in that case, you have to take care of the amount supplied into the bioreactor, right? And here, when cells will undergo the uh, proliferation, that means they are growing, then amount of cells are increasing. And with respect to that, the amount of solid phase, solid volume fraction is going to increase inside the bioreactor. And with respect to more amount of cells, 
large amount of nutrient concentration is required to fulfill the requirement of each cells right so here what we can observe is when you have less amount of cells nutrient concentration is fine but when our cells are increasing this from red to black it is showing that your amount of cells are increasing in that case there is a deficiency in the nutrient concentration now this deficiency is a matter of concern and that we have to overcome while our experiment is being performed right so how to overcome this because we have looked at the packley number also so we can see there is an impact of fluid volumetric flux onto the whole bioreactor so this if you are going to control the fluid volumetric flux then we can control the amount of nutrient uh, nutrient concentration supplied inside the bioreactor and over time right so what we are looking at over here is if you have different width of the scaffold this will be your amount of nutrient uh, flux volumetric flux that you have to control when your cells are increasing so suppose your initial amount of cells was 0.1 and it is growing up to 0.5 right this much amount of uh, uh, space will be occupied by cells then within this time period when cells are growing first you need to increase your volumetric flux because when cells uh, there will be less um, space inside the scaffold you will require high packley number for the cells to increase the uh, nutrient concentration and after some point it will be in the saturation point where from that side you have to decrease the amount of nutrient concentration otherwise this fluid volumetric flux otherwise there will be large amount of deformation with respect to large volume volumetric flux uh, with respect to high solid uh, volume fraction and that will create the or that may damage your scaff scaffold also right so these things we have to take care of so this is how we are providing a useful data to our experimentalist so that they can perform a successful experiments right so these things are already in development and in this scenario we have shown with respect to different cells where they have different kind of metabolism how you have to control the fluid volumetric flux supplied to one end of the bioreactor so as i said these things are under development and there are many things which we have missed in this uh, model also like an isotropic nature of the scaffold so it is not necessary that it will be all, always isotropic also heterogeneous nature of the scaffold right so these are some things moreover we have considered very short time so here cells uh, fluid volumetric flux solid volumetric flux these are not increasing right so with respect to that our governing equation will be very much hectic to solve and we require more mathematical knowledge to solve these kind of numerical techniques to solve these right so this is how in a certain manner we are providing some data to our experimentalists to perform their successful experiments right so this is our, our recommendation to our um, experimental friends so who are doing uh, experiments so how to keep control on the fluid volumetric flux that is required throughout the experiment then which kind of scaffold material will be suitable for the cells with respect to their elasticity because elasticity plays very important role to support the cells metabolism then the nature of the scaffold material which have a property of slip so i did not talk about this much but this is also one thing which uh, can support the fluid flow inside the bioreactor another is the optimal width with respect to the requirement of your size of the scaffold right so these are the references i will be very much happy to answer your questions thank you dr prakash for this nice presentation uh, audience uh, anyone has any question please ask hello any kind of question yeah 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 dr ganesh yeah so i have one question basically 
So yeah. starting from your governing equation in the continuity yes. and momentum equations, you use the yes. PTAC phase, right? Yes, yes, so yes. So what does it mean? That is, please yes. explain PTAC phase one more time. Beta is the beta is just notation. Beta, if you are going to replace with S, that means you are talking about the solid volume, uh, solid volume fraction, right? So that will be the conservation of mass for the solid phase. And if you are going to replace the beta with your F, that would be your conservation of mass for the fluid phase. Right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. And this, this amount, this J beta, this denotes the net production of net production of your solid phase. Or if you are replacing beta with F, that means the net degradation of fluid phase. Yes. Thank you, Prakash. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, Prakash, one question is that what is the solid velocity? That solid means? velocity means displacement of the solid phase. So we are accounting only displacement of the solid. If you want to look at the solid velocity, you have to just take the uh, time derivative of your solid. Then momentum that means it is only It is only yes, the yes. displacement. There is no direction. Means the solid velocity it is there only is the displacement. There is no direction. Okay. Yeah, displacement is a vector. Displacement is a vector. Vector. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Obviously. Yes. Anyone else? Uh, Doctor Prakash, uh, I have yeah. a question. Uh, yeah. In the equation one, suppose uh, for beta equals to s. Uh, yes. So how you are calculating or how you are means, uh, planning to calculate uh, the volume fraction of solid in case of this uh, mathematical modeling? See, as I said that we are capturing very short scale of time. So yes. in that phase, what we are doing is mm. in that case, we are assuming our volume fractions to be constant because we rarely see any development in the cells in a short uh, period of time to okay. see the development in cells it will take like weeks right and we are our mathematical model is based on our uh, one hour or two hour kind of time period so in that case this term is going over this is constant this will come out of your volume fraction and because there is no mm -hmm. development we are seeing so this will be kind of just del dot vf yeah is equal to zero and del dot vs equal to zero. So that we know it is kind of uh, uh, easy for us to solve. But in other scenario, when we are going to consider large amount of time and these volume fractions are not uh, constant, in that case, it will be very difficult for us to solve uh, unless we are going for a numerical method. Because what is what will happen over here is, in order to calculate this volume fraction, you first have to know that what is your fluid velocity, right? And in order to calculate your fluid velocity from your nearest Stokes equation here, biphasic mixture equation. So you see this term, mm -hmm. this term is expanded in the terms of fluid volume fraction as well as the whole dietric stress tensors, right? So this term is again required over here. Now you can see if this depends on the Space as well as time, it will be very typical equation to solve, right? And moreover, you are dealing with two kind of governing equations. One is parabolic in nature, one is hyperbolic in nature. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and uh, in the second equation, equation two, uh, this uh, first uh, multiplicative factor, rho b, rho beta, yes. rho suffix yes. beta. Yes. So this is the dense. Yeah. Uh, it is the density, I think, of yes, yes. for the solid or fluid. Fluid phase, yes. Solid or fluid means either both, or, right? No, uh, this uh, is the governing equation for both of the phases. So if you yes, replace uh, beta so, with S, you will get the governing equation for solid. Yes. No, so my question is, I understand, I understood that. My question is that uh, rho suffix beta will mm -hmm. not be, will not remain constant all the time. Yes, exactly. So how you are taking care of that? This beta is depending on the fluid volume, at, uh, this volume fraction itself. So as stress tensors will be increasing, these uh, the amount of fluid volume flux will be, uh, sorry, 
volume uh, this volume fraction will be increasing that will be uh, just putting a condition on your density also so density here is given by phi f okay. by phi f by the actual density of these phases okay. so this is depending so on is, the volume fraction itself so it is an effective density right yes yes not exactly. not constant not constant this is okay. effective with respect to the macro scale so when you are non dimensional it so we have to take care about this row also na no? row beta yes yes yes, yes. everything yes. we have to take care of and eventually mm -hmm. when we are talking about uh, short time scale we are neglecting this whole inertial terms for simplification in mathematics uh, our mathematical model if you are going to use all these it will be very challenging for us to deal with okay yeah. okay yeah. okay so either you use okay. perturbation methods that we have used sometimes uh, to deal with this convection as well as this inertial term or uh, you have to just uh, ignore this term okay uh, another question from my end uh, yes, yes. you said that uh, you have solved these equations using perturbation method yes, yes. is it uh, yes, so yes. Uh, in that case uh, what is the perturbation parameter Yes, Choose. that I am coming because here our width of the scaffold and all these things, or you say a hollow fiber membrane bioreactor, this is very less in compared to the length of the bioreactor. So if you see okay. the genuine hollow fiber membrane bioreactor, it will mm. look something like this. So this you see. So this is of the scale kind of 10 centimeter you can see, and the width okay. is very less, right? So yeah, this yeah. will be our perturbation parameter. Epsilon will be the height of the, uh, the width of the scaffold by the length of the whole scaffold. That will be our perturbation parameter. Okay. Yeah. The aspect ratio. Yes, aspect ratio. That will be our okay. perturbation parameter to simplify our governing equations. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So any questions from the audience? Any more questions? If no questions are there, uh, let me- Thank you. Explain. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Prakash, for your nice presentation. It's really good Thank to you see very you. Much. After, it's my pleasure. After, after a long time, it's almost one year we have met. Yeah. 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 And presentation was very nice. Yeah, yes, yeah, it's you, very Amit. good. It's it's like we are sitting in IIT Kharagpur BRZ seminar hall that you are presenting. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> yeah, <nice>. yeah. <laughs> I also have the same feeling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very good to see. Thank you, Prakash. Yeah, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Rakesh. Now, Prakash, at the end of this uh, 22nd Siksha Anusandan weekly academic lecture, I shall take the liberty of proposing vote of thanks. We thank the speaker, Dr. Prakash Kumar, so whose talk has introduced us with the possible mathematical applications in modeling of bioreactors in tissue engineering. Our thanks are due to the colleagues, this scholars and students in the audience. Our big thanks go to uh, Dr. Manujan Naik, the honorable president, of Siksha Anusandan Dean TV University, who has been always a source of inspiration to all of us. I extend our thanks to Professor Majula Das, the head of Center for Data Science for the necessary supports, and Dr. Amit Kumar for helping us to connect with uh, Dr. Prakash Kumar. Lastly, on behalf of the Center for Data Science, uh, Siksha Anusandan Dean TV University, extend our heartfelt thanks to all. Thank you, uh, Dr. Prakash. Thank you very much for this nice presentation and introduction, <laughs> and uh, finding a valuable time in this uh, Christmas day. Yeah, and Merry Christmas to you all. Yeah. Yeah. So I am officially ending the recording and ending the meeting also. So again, happy um, Merry Christmas to all. And thank, thank you. you.
थैंक यू एवरीवन थैंक यू फॉर योर टाइम थैंक यू